Hey, Amen. Well, let's get those Bibles out and go to the book of Psalms, chapter 66. Of course, you know we're having a graduation. Yes. Amen. As soon as I get done ministering, we have two gentlemen that have successfully completed the faith home. Yes. Amen. They're going to be sharing what the Lord has done in their lives. Amen. Psalm 66. And when you get there, say, thank you, Jesus. How many people were here last night? We had a Spanish service. It was powerful. Wow. I thought there was going to be some dancing and stuff, but they ministered to us, and it was really powerful. Amen. Uh, I think a divine appointment, a relationship was uh, birth. So uh, see them uh, doing more stuff here at the LRC. Amen. Amen. Psalms 66. Let's look at verse number 10. Psalm 66, verse number 10. It says, for thou, O God, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. You brought us, us into the net. You laid affliction upon our loins. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you have brought us out into a wealthy place. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you this morning for the awesome opportunity to minister your word. And Father God, I ask right now that you will give me the words of wisdom, the words of knowledge, the words of understanding. Father God, that you will give me utterance this morning to open my mouth boldly and speak as you would have me to speak. Father God, I pray this morning that your people will hear your voice in my voice. Father God, use the word this morning to speak into people's lives, speak into their situations, speak into their circumstances. Father God, give them answers, Father God, understanding to life, Father God, right now. And, Father God, I pray right now and ask that the body of Christ here at the LRC be edified, built up, strengthened, refreshed in the inner man like never before. Lord, let it not just be information, but let it be an impartation of your spirit. Father God, not only to, to hear the word, but to do the word. So, Father God, we just thank you for it right now, Father God, wisdom that cannot be debated away. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, say amen. You have bought us into a wealthy place. Anybody going through something right now? Anybody in the middle of a trial right now? Anybody in the middle of a battle right now? Well, this word is for you, amen? One of the greatest tra tragedies of life is when people go through difficult times. What happens is some sometimes people become what they go through. The abused becomes the abuser. Even sometimes people that are not directly involved, innocent bystanders, become affected by the actions of others. They even vow to themselves, I will never be like that. But it's almost like an invisible force takes over and they become the very thing that they despised. But it's not so in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God... When you go through things as a born-again believer, it's as though God protects you and preserves his children from the things that life throws at them. Before becoming a Christian, you are subject to the things of the world. You are subject to uh, 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 the things that came to abuse us, to rape us, to defeat us. And then what happens is we're left with the outcome or the results. We become uh, victims of what we went through. But I notice in the kingdom of God, it's not so. The Bible says in Psalms 41, you don't have to go there, the Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. God has a way that even when we go through things as a Christian, he has an invisible force around us to preserve us through the things that we go through. The Bible says you're in the world, but you're not of the world. I can have you in it, but at the same time, you're not of it. And I will make sure that no matter what you go through while you're living here on planet Earth, thus saith the Lord, it will not affect your life. Matter of fact, I'll turn what you thought was sent into your life to subtract and take away from your life, and I'll make it become something that adds to your life and makes you better when you come out 
on the other side. The Bible said that, listen, he caused men to ride over our heads. We went through affliction. We went through all this trouble. But on the other side, God brought us out into a wealthy place, a place of nothing missing, a nothing broken, a place of transformation, a place where you came out better than when you went in. Even from the beginning in my own walk with the Lord, after being saved and going back to my old ways, I remember whenever I made a decision to go back to the Lord, the cleansing agent of the blood of Jesus went to work to wash me and cleanse me from the dirt of the world. I remember falling after being saved and and delivered and going back to my old ways. And I remember that God, uh, through his goodness, brought me to a place of repentance. And listen, the Bible says that the goodness of God will lead men to repentance. I want you to know that God is not a condemner. That God is not trying to kill you. That God is not bashing you over the head when you make a mistake. That, listen, guilt and condemnation is not a work of the spirit, but it's actually a work of the flesh. And, listen, you don't have to walk in guilt and condemnation one second in your life because, like they were singing, God is a good God. God is good all the time, even in your weaknesses, even in your mess-ups. The Bible says that a righteous man will fall seven times. But he gets back up. Who picks him back up? It's the goodness of God that lifts a man back up, that takes a man out of the pit and puts him back. Listen, listen, on the mountaintop of life. It's the goodness of God that has you here this morning. Despite what you went through last week, you still found the strength and the courage to step into the house of Almighty God because God is a good God. God is not mad at you. God did not get up on the, on, on, on the wrong side of the bed. God is not trying to judge you. God is not trying to condemn you. God is not trying to keep a scorecard of your goods and your bads. Jesus already accomplished the good in your life, and God looks at Jesus when he looks at you, not what you've done, not what you're doing, or not even what you're going to do. You're already good in the eyes of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I remember coming back to God and his spirit anointing me afresh and me in my mind like it like it never even happened. Matter of fact, the Bible says he'll take your sins and cast them as far as the east is from the west. He says your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. So what are you doing remembering him? And don't let nobody remind you of them either. That's in the sea of forgetfulness. The enemy thinks that his attacks are going to take you out. He does not realize that the things you go through actually are working for your good. Look at your neighbor and say, the thing that you're going through is actually working for your good. How can you say that, Pastor Tone? Because sometimes we attribute goodness whether it feels good. If it don't feel good, we think it's bad. David said, it's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I may learn the ways of God. So sometimes in affliction, you're learning something about God that you can't learn from a book, from somebody's testimony. There's some stuff you're never going to know about God until you walk through it yourself. I believe in books, I believe in videos, I listen to tons of teachings, but ultimately my revelation from God comes through what I walk through on a daily basis. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Look at your name and say, all things things are working working together together for the good. good. 
I began to look back in my life and realize that even going through drug addiction, crime, and all that bad stuff, everything that hell could throw at my life ultimately led me into the arms of Jesus. It ultimately led me to a jail cell where I cried out to the Lord. God caused all the bad, the good, the bad, and the ugly to work for my good to bring me right into the place of relationship with him. The devil thought it was over. The devil thought that was it. The devil thought I was down for the count. They were about to have a funeral, and Jesus stepped in and said, I don't think so. What you thought was the end is about to be a new beginning in this land's life. They never expected me to walk out of a jail cell born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your outcome in God will always be good. In Exodus 1.8, it says this. The Egyptians were dealing with the children of Israel. Go there. Let's go there. Put your eyes on it. This is good stuff. Somebody say perspective. perspective. Sometimes what it is, we're going through things, but we're looking at it the wrong way. And sometimes God has to change our perspective. And then people will kind of look at you like you're crazy and say, how in the world can you be joyful despite all you're going through? Because I have God's perspective. Exodus 1, let's look at verse number 8. It says, now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass, when there falleth out of any war, they join also to our enemies and fight against us, and to get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithon and Ramses. But they, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because the children of Israel. You see, Israel was God's chosen people. God's covenant people. Do you think for one second God was going to let Egypt wipe the children of Israel out when he knew that his son Jesus, the Redeemer, was connected to that race of people? God flipped the script on them, and they, what they thought was going to take them out actually caused them to grow and multiply and become even greater than they thought. And God sent me this morning to tell you what you're going through is not wiping you out. On the contrary, it's making you better, greater, growing, multiplying like never before. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. This last year, I've grown leaps and bounds. This last year... My inner man has been expanded into another level. This last year, my capacity for dealing with stuff has gone to a whole nother realm that I thought I could never achieve. Stuff that I thought would have took me out cannot take me out because God was working in the midst of the affliction and the taskmasters and the things that was coming against my life to make me better than I was before it happened. Now, when you're going through it, it don't feel good. When you're going through it, you're asking, where is the Lord? Where are you, God? Do you hear my cry? Do you hear my prayer? 
And I realized if he's not changing it, he's not changing it because he realized it's changing you. If you're asking for something to change and it's not changing because God is saying, you know what, I'm not just going to change it because what I see is changing you and making you more like my son Jesus. So I'm not going to move it. I'm going to keep it there, and you're going to grow through this thing. You're going to make it through. You'll, you'll gird up your loins like a good soldier and walk this thing out and grow up. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Afflict means to distress with mental or bodily pain, to trouble greatly or grievously. Anybody ever gone through trouble? Like, my God, where is this coming from? Get through one, here comes another one. But listen, stop looking at the outside. Look on the inside. What is happening on the inside of me? You see, the enemy doesn't know that God is using it to grow you. The Bible says this about Jesus' crucifixion. It said, had they known that Jesus was going to fulfill redemption through the cross, the devil would have never crucified the Lord of glory. How many people know you got to have a crucifixion before a resurrection? Some of y'all are being crucified. Some stuff in you is being crucified so you can have that resurrection that you've been praying about. There is no resurrection unless there is a crucifixion. And sometimes God is using that situation to crucify something that he detected on the inside of you. Look at your David and say, some stuff in you has got to die. You know, God, he sees past all our facades. He sees past all our fronts. He sees past the, 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 the thread in the suit. He sees past the, 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 the bones. He sees past all of that stuff, and he looks on the intents of our hearts. I'm learning that God is concerned about not so much what we do. He's concerned about why we do what we do. Why do you want it? Why? You know, I had the honor of of serving under Bishop for many years. And one thing that was imparted to me, he was never into titles, positions, he despised that, and that was imparted to me. Matter of fact, when he, somebody sees somebody jockeying for position, they just put themselves at the back of the line. Matter of fact, when people began to bring out their resume, God, I did this, God, I did that. Okay, that's good. Bye. Excellence doesn't have to say anything. Faithfulness doesn't have to utter a word. You just do it. Amen? The Lord is a teacher. He's always teaching. The Bible in James 1 says, Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith produces patience. How many people know that anybody can say they have faith when everything's cool, calm, and collective? (laughs) Peter said, Lord, I'll never deny you. I'll always follow you. Jesus said, listen, Peter, you don't even know what's in your own heart. Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. He didn't even know what was in his heart. But God knows what's in our hearts. And listen, your faith will be tried. I'm learning that your faith will be tried. When you boldly proclaim, Sam, you better get ready. Uh Uh-oh. Let's see if he's got the goods. (laughs) 
Sometimes you're not going to know if you have the goods unless your faith goes through something. Like I said, this last year, I realized, you know what? God has done a great work in me. God has done a phenomenal building on the inside of me that is beyond myself. And listen, I encourage you, no matter what you may be going through, let God work. Don't jump out the fire. Stay in the fire of affliction and let God work it out. Listen, you're going to go through hell either way. You're going to go through hell with God or the devil's going to put you in hell if you leave God. But listen, in God, you come out with a prophet. The devil is going to wipe your life out and kill, steal, and destroy everything that you have. So if I'm going to go through it, I might as well come out with a prophet on the other side. Amen. In Romans 5, it says, let us rejoice, this is how to amplify, in our hope. Hope and confident assurance of experiencing and enjoying the glory of our great God. The manifestations of his excellent power. And not only this, but with joy, let us exult in our sufferings and rejoice. What? In hardships, knowing that hardship, distress, pressure, trouble produces patience and endurance. And endurance, proven character, spiritual maturity, and proven character, hope, and confident assurance of eternal salvation. Such hope in God's promises never disappoints us because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit that was given to us. But Paul, the writer of this, this letter, said, let us exult in suffering. Let us rejoice in hardships knowing that it's working character development on the inside of me. Knowing that I'm going to come out better. How many people want to be better? How many people want to grow up and get out of the little kid games? I got a crew that works in the warehouse. These guys are awesome. Where are the guys that work in the warehouse? Stand up. The warehouse is one of the greatest work points of this ministry. You can sit down, gentlemen. There's something going on constantly. We got trucks coming in. We got trucks being unloaded. They got to sort it out. They got to uh, uh, organize. They got to do rotations on our freezers, on our coolers. Then you got 40 ministries that come here in a week getting loaded also and then throw an 18-wheeler Operation Blessing truck once a month in the mix. And listen, but I noticed that I walked through with these guys. They're not getting stressed out. Come on, come on. They're working heartily unto the Lord. I don't see no murmuring, no complaining. I'm like, man, I see more maturity in there sometimes than I see in here. It's about 3 million pounds of food coming through this, or maybe more, through this ministry a year. And these are the guys, of course we oversee it, but these are the guys that are hand on, that are handling it, processing it, and not losing their mind. Amen. Just to let you guys know, somebody's always watching. But listen, God knows if they can handle 4 million pounds of food, 3 million pounds of food without murmuring, complaining, I can trust you with your family back. I can give you that wife. I can give you that job. I can give you that business. If you can handle and keep your cool, take a licking and keep on ticking, I will bless you because you've been proven through the fire of affliction. I mean, I, I walked through there, and then my wife came here yesterday and said they were still working past 12 o'clock. 2.30 they were working. No complaining. Still getting it done. I got some people, it goes over time, it's like, we got to wrap it up. I 
I know I'm stepping on some people's toes, but God will heal your toes. You're either going to get offended or get better. You're either going to get bitter or get better. You know how many times I had Pastor Fur get in my face and confront me about stuff? I could have got mad. Who you think you're talking to? I wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> Humble yourself under the hand of God and let him exalt you in due season. You have to submit to divine authority. It's God's way. Even if you don't agree or like the authority, you just got to do it. That's part of God's process. Y'all still love me? <laughs> now, listen, this boldness is beyond my character. I'd rather be in the back chilling like Angel right now. That's not me. But God said, listen, if you feel that utterance coming up, you better let it rip. Let it hit, because whom the Lord loves, he corrects. He said, if you are without a whipping, you're a bastard. Any father is going to chasten his children. Or you just let them continue in error. No, God's going to deal with error. Somebody say, this is the vegetables of the gospel. But, man, you should be talking about, I'm trying to get you in the blessing. Come on. Yes, sir. Trying to get you out of the wilderness into the promised land. God wants to give you a hope bank account. Say a hope bank account. Deposits are made in the account every time you go through something, every time you overcome a test or a trial. In that bank account is to be used when you go through hopeless situations. Withdrawals from the hope account are made when you go through something. You know how David defeated Goliath? He went into the hope account. He said, hmm, Goliath, I've never faced a foe like you before. But let me reach into my hope account. Wait a minute, God gave me the victory over the lion? over the bear, and guess what? I got hope. I'm going to whip you. You're going down. I got a hope account set up. And now that hope, where it's got a whole nation hopeless, now I got hope to overcome this. So when you go through stuff, you're banking a hope account. You know how big my hope account is now? had the honor of being with uh, Pastor Ralph and him sharing the history of this ministry with me. And Bishop shared a lot of the history also. But in the sharing of the testimony of the ministry, um, he doesn't know, but he made deposits in my hope account. That I know that even though individuals go through difficult times, ministries can go through difficult seasons. Amen. But listen, he is a witness, and I'm a witness, but he on another level that, listen, through it all, Tone, God was faithful to protect his work and to continue the work celebrating now 66 years of ministry. The history is not all glamorous. It was some stuff I was like, are you serious? That happened? And it was still here because God's hand is on his work. Last scripture, let's go to 2 Corinthians, cutting it short because we got a graduation, give these guys plenty of time. 2 Corinthians 12. Church, you got to understand, if we don't grow up, we can't go up. It's not all on me. God has to get the people that's around me to grow up too or it can't grow up. 
I realize now that Bishop's biggest battle was not the devil. It was immaturity. And it frustrated him because he knew there should be more. But I'm going to hit it. <laughs> I'm going to talk about it. Second uh, Corinthians 12, verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord. Let's start at verse 7. Unless I should be exalted above measure. Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Some of us are too strong in ourselves. We got too much confidence in the flesh. And God will break that flesh down till your confidence is on him. Y'all see me getting up here ministering the word in boldness and authority. But listen, my prayer is, God, help me. Help me minister to your people. God, I can't do this without you. I need your grace. I need your words. I need your anointing. I'm not going to get up here thinking I got it all together. I need your grace. Help me, Father. And then when it's time, in my weakness, his power shows up. To fulfill the mission. I shared y'all last week about Moses. Before God called him, he went through a season where God brought him through a humility process because God knew he could not use him until he went through that process. So some of y'all in the process of crucifying confidence in the flesh. I'll say it again. Sometimes we're asking God to take something away and it's not changing. But what God is allowing it for you to be changed by the thing that's in your life. In your weakness, his power is going to show strong through you. You can just write this down. Last scripture, Isaiah 48, 10. Listen to this. It says, behold, I have refined you, but not with silver. I've chosen, chosen you in the furnish of affliction. Somebody say refiner. refiner. Listen to this. Refining gold with fire is one of the oldest methods of refining metals. It's mentioned even the Bible refining by fire. This involved a craftsman sitting next to a hot fire with molten gold in a crucible being stirred and skimmed to remove the impurities or dross that rose to the top of the molten metal. With flames reaching temperatures in excess of 1,000 degrees Celsius, the gold was put through this process to refine it. I didn't know this. You ever heard of 18 karat gold, 10 karat gold? Did you know that 10 karat gold and I think 14 karat gold has uh, some of it has even less than 50 percent of gold in it? It's mixed with other metals. It's not until you get to 24 karat gold that it begins to become 100 percent gold. So listen, God is not into the 10 karat gold business. God is not into 18 karat gold. I know it may you may get a deal on it. I know it may be a little cheaper. But God said, I'm not into the cheap. I'm into the gold that's refined with fire. 
And I don't want you to be a 10 carat Christian. I don't want you to be 18 carats. I want you to be 25 carat. Pure gold. No other metals, no other tarnishment. And I'm willing to sit there and hold you in that fire to all that dross comes to the top. I scrape it away, and then I put you right back in that fire till that dross comes back up to the top, and I scrape it away. And I'm not going to stop until you come forth as pure gold. Job said this, behold, I go forward, but he's not there. Backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left, where doth he work? But I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. My God. I said all that to say this, that the Lord is using the faith home. To refine men and women. He is taking them through the fire so they can become all that God has called them to be. He is using classes. He is using their relationships with one another and leadership. He's also using real life scenarios to bring up the junk to remove it so they can walk in the place of pure gold with God. The faith home is one of God's crucibles it's one of the things where he puts you in it's a place where he exposes you to the fire God said I'm a consuming fire and listen I'm going to consume everything in your life that's not of me that's not like that not like me you know some people run from this some people can't face themselves some people it's too hot some people it's too rough but listen stay in the fire men and women Let God do what he needs to do. Let him bring up the junk. Let him bring up the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because I guarantee you, the way you came in is not the way you're going out. You're coming out as pure gold. You're coming out brand new. You're going to be shining to your family. You're going to be shining on the job. You're going to be shining to this world. You're going to come forth as pure gold. Lift your hands up and say, refine me, Lord. Lord. Get all the junk out. out. Purge me. me. Make me pure. pure. In Jesus' name. name. Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. We went down to American Builders, which is a company around the corner from here, and they've been hiring the men and women of the faith home. So we got a chance to talk with the bosses over there, and they are, like, blown away by the character of the men and the women of the faith home that's working for them. They are saying, can you send us more? They are saying, listen to this. They said that, listen, our CEO has taken notice. And now we're using this relationship as a model to use at our other companies that now other locations are looking for faith-based ministries to be an employee pool to make for their employees to come to. The Lighthouse set a prototype for a company outside of here. Because men and women have decided to come forth as pure gold. My brother Luther and Rosby working for the Department of Juvenile Justice, shining like a light of pure gold, where they want more of our graduates to come in. Matter of fact, one of the graduates this morning is in the process of getting hired over there. We need to take it and infiltrate the community. Amen? Amen? Because this is a good thing. Sometimes we don't even realize what we got. It takes somebody from the outside to look to say, man, you guys... This is real. This is the real deal. Amen. Glory. Where they at? Y'all ready? You can be seated. We're going to have a faith home.